and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. We're coming at you live on the Dark Matter Radio Network. We have a great show for you today. In a few minutes, we have our astronomy clip coming up with Andy Fleming, UFO News with the one, the only, John Tobin. And our guest for the show today is Kurt Collins. Kurt was on the past show uh, with an interview with Colby Landrum. He basically interviewed Colby about the Cash Landrum case. But, you know, I wanted to get him back. He's an interesting guy, smart, and uh, and he's real balanced. So he's going to be on tonight. His website is blue blurry not barry blue blurry lines dot blogspot dot com for those of you who have been emailing me i do apologize i'm in the middle of a project and i'll get back to you when i can i do have to say though some emails get to be uh that you might write me out there or like four or five pages long and i gotta tell you i can't read those i get all add'd out my add has separation anxiety and I can't read them. So if you want me to respond, just write uh, maybe a single paragraph or two, and I will respond to you. So, hey, John, how you doing? I'm excellent, Martin. How are you? Do you get those long emails where you just can't read them? I mean, <laughs> I don't get any emails. <laughs> <laughs> I get emails, you know, uh, spam. That's about it. You know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I wake up every morning to a, a slew of spam that I just like. <laughs> Delete, 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 delete every day. So, yeah, if I can't yeah. cut it up and put it on a sandwich, I don't want any spam. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't like spam. <laughs> so, uh, so how's everything going? Things are going well. You know, it's been a, a busy week, as you mentioned, but uh, overall, very well. Can't complain. Well, uh, again, I'm glad to have you here with the news. And let's see. Let's, uh, let's take a listen to – we have Andy Fleming. And, you know, the, it always comes up, and it's going to be part of our news, too. It always comes up that uh, – Skeptics say that you just plain can't get here from there, and that's why we are not seeing any, you know, UFOs, and UFOs can't get here because it's physically impossible. So here's Andy Fleming right now for this week's astronomy bit. You can't get from there to here is a recurrent claim often made by debunkers of the alien visitation hypothesis. But why not? There's nothing in the laws of physics to prevent it, although interstellar distances are truly vast. For example, the nearest star, the red dwarf Proxima Centauri, is at least 39.9 trillion kilometres away. Astronomers use light years to measure such vast distances. It's the distance light, travelling at 300,000 kilometres per second, travels in one year. At this speed, it would still take over four years to reach Proxima Centauri. To viably travel such distances in a human lifetime, we need to utilise propulsion systems that are theoretically possible, but beyond current technology. These would provide velocities close to that of light, or what scientists call relativistic speeds. There are certain problems, however. In a spacecraft travelling at such speed, the passage of time slows down relative to the observer in Earth's frame of reference. Hence, on a return journey to Proxima Centauri, virtually no time would have passed at all in the spacecraft's frame of reference, yet eight and a half years would have passed here on the Earth. This has nothing to do with watches, clocks or the human ageing process. It's counterintuitive, I know, and it's because the passage of time is relative, depending on your velocity relative to other points of reference. 
This is at the heart of Einstein's famous 1905 paper entitled On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, his theory of special relativity. It is the speed of light that's the universal constant and not time, as Isaac Newton propounded. Another problem is that according to the paper's primary equation, E equals mc squared, as you travel towards the speed of light, ever-increasing amounts of energy are required. To travel at the speed of light, a macroscopic object such as a spacecraft requires an infinite amount of energy and will acquire an infinite amount of mass too. Light itself can travel at this speed precisely because its photon particles are massless. But here's a thought. Space-time itself can expand at velocities far greater than that of light. Cosmic inflation theory, widely accepted by cosmologists, states that in a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, our universe expanded to a gargantuan size at an unimaginable speed. This raises the possibility of interstellar travel via the use of Star Trek-like warp drives. Space-time would be shrunk in front of your craft and expanded rapidly at its rear. Admittedly, massive amounts of exotic matter and energy would be required. And then, of course, there are black holes. These are gravitational sinkholes in our universe, stellar remnants created by collapsed massive stars that have detonated as supernovae. Could the material entering a black hole exit in another area of our space-time in what is commonly called a wormhole? Theoretical work by physics has illustrated that these advanced propulsion systems for interstellar travel are indeed possible and highlights the debunkers' claims as speculation at best. They mean that we can't get from here to there. For a paradigm-shifting breakthrough, we need new theories and, above all, imaginative scientists freed from the shackles of prevailing paradigms and conventional self-reinforcing prejudices. We may be just four centuries down the road of the scientific enterprise. However, in an immensely old and vast universe, I believe that there are many civilizations that are significantly further down that road. To believe otherwise is a regression to pre-Copernicanism and anthropocentrism. And who knows, some of those civilizations may be visiting the Earth right now. Yeah, I can buy that. That was pretty good, hi huh, John? Yeah, absolutely, uh, very good. Yeah. It, it, uh, definitely. Mm. Yeah. You know, I mean, you always hear that there's just no way. And uh, later on in the news, I think we're going to kind of talk a little bit about uh, one of the uh, science magazines. I think it's Discovery Science or something like that. But let's, so let's just roll right in with the news. Let's do that. Actually, yeah, the first, uh, the first story tonight actually has to do with the Big Bang. A smoking gun possibly uh, found. Discovery News, as you mentioned, reports uh, for the first time scientists have found direct evidence of the expansion of the universe. It's a previously uh, theoretical event that took place a fraction of a second after the Big Bang explosion nearly 14 billion years ago. The clue is encoded in the prim primordial cosmic microwave background radiation that continues to spread through space to this day. Uh, this has to do with the gravitational waves and all kinds of recent scientific theories. Uh, you can connect to this article, Martin, of course, as well as all of our other news stories and our show notes at podcastufo.com. Yes, I, I read that article, and it, it gets really, really into it. Um, you know, we're, you just touched on, like, the light surface of it. But, um, you know, it seems like the more and more they look, the more and more they find, and, uh, and it could be interesting. You know, I'm not 100% sold on the Big Bang, no matter how much evidence they have. It's just, it's just so hard to understand what was there before or if it's a cycle that keeps happening you know maybe all the black holes swallow everything up and it goes down to nothing again and this <laughs> maybe this has happened like over and over again but how did it ever start you know it's so like it's just too intense to think about all the whole it's, thing 
it's very intense, and maybe it's the land where all the missing socks live. You know, I don't know. That's what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> all right, what else is going on? We've got some other interesting stories too. Possibly a solar system out there littered with, littered with alien artifacts. That's another Discovery News article. Uh, there's some great stuff out there uh, this week. Two Pioneer probes, a pair of Voyagers, and the New Horizon craft now speeding towards Pluto. If the aliens' motivations may be the same as ours, if we found an Earth-like world nearby, there would be an inevitable desire to send unmanned aircraft uh, to see what kinds of creatures are living there. Looking for alien calling cards in the solar system is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. It's been popularized in numerous science fiction stories, movies, TV shows, etc., etc. So it's an interesting uh, theory. It is, but, you know, it just begs to ask the question, what, well, maybe we are being visited by probes. Maybe that's what some of the UFOs are. You know, but they'll never think that way. They just say, well, there's no evidence out there. So, But, um, you know... Maybe some of the UFOs that we're seeing or all these people are seeing are probes that are exploring and observing us. I mean, they never even talk about that. I think that's rather curious. They don't talk about it very often at all, and I, I agree with you. I think it's rather curious, and I think there's something to that for sure. Uh, way too coincidental that you know thousands and thousands of UFO sightings and none of them could possibly be visiting us. I think that's, uh, or other worlds for that matter, you know? Yeah, yeah, they just don't want to hear about it. We're just <laughs> all a bunch of kooks, you know. <laughs> so what else is happening? Well, you know, unfortunately, we do have some sad news this oh, week. Oh, yeah. Uh, we want to say wish rest in peace to Dr. Roger Lear. Uh, past guest Dr. Roger Lear passed away, unfortunately, on March 14th. Uh, he was a devoted, devoted ufologist, and he really brought the alleged alien implants to the forefront through surgically removing them and also running tests to explore what they were. So... We just want to rest. Uh, we just want to wish, you know, rest in peace to Dr. Lear and uh, all of his work. Very uh, fondly thinking of him uh, this week. Yeah, and his family. And um, we have in our show notes his website, and there is a little place there if you wanted to make a donation in memory of him. Um, it's right on his website there. And you know, he was a real nice gentleman. I really enjoyed uh, speaking to him, and he seemed like you know there was no games. I mean, he had a he also talked about the uh, Turkey UFO incident, which was a major UFO sighting seen by lots and lots of people. And a real nice guy, and he will sorely be missed. Absolutely. And uh, it, it's, it's a shame uh, when anyone passes, but when someone has done so much for uh, this field, uh, for ufology, it's a, just a really, it's, it's a damp mode. And uh, in the next story, you know, not, not that this next story is certainly not uh, uplifting in any way, but it's certainly a mystery. It's when we talked about you and I last week a little bit, and now it's kind of come out uh, in uh, the UFO news here uh, about the Malaysian uh, Flight 370. Um, possibly an alien abduction. Uh, a lot of other theories have been talked about, and there's certainly tons of speculation that continues just this evening and every evening for that matter. Uh, but our guest here on the show, Martin, in a few weeks, the MUFON State Director, John Venture, or Ventry, how do you pronounce yes, it? Yes, Ventry. Ventry, okay, great. He claims uh, Malaysian Airline Flight 370, the crew and passengers were uh, abducted by extraterrestri extraterrestrials. Um, this story, his claim, made CNN, and uh, you can also read the full story through the link in our show notes. Now, yeah. What do you think about this? Well, yeah, I, uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm not one who really enjoys confrontation, but I, I'm going to have to talk to him about this because uh, I, I, think it, I think it was rather a bizarre a case to make. And also, you know, he, he sort of dragged Mufon's name into it, and he's in that new show, and I hear it's a good show, you know, by most people. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm not really sure what to think about it, but I do have to talk to him about it. You know, I like to be open-minded, but for that to happen, I, you know, I think that's really going way overboard making a, a claim like that. It, yeah. it's, it, it is an, it's kind of an outrageous claim to come out without, it, unless you had some solid proof to back it up. And at this point, it doesn't seem like there's solid proof of anything really showing exactly what might have happened. It's all speculation. And, you know, non-alien explanations are still speculation at this point. I will admit, though, that for myself, you know, I think a lot of us, the thought popped into our mind when several days went by and this thing was still missing. But I think the reality that kicks into our minds kicked in and, and said, you know, really not likely. But, uh, it, you know, we thought of it, I think. <laughs> so yeah, so. yeah, of course, you know. But, you know, there's so many other answers that will, you know, it's probably, I think we will probably know what happened eventually. It's just, 
you know, where it crashed, you know, it probably ditched in the ocean. It's a big ocean. And, um, you know, there, there's actually some talk about satellite images of possibly seeing some type of debris or something like that. So I think within, you know, within a few weeks we'll probably know. But it sure is a mystery that something like that happening. That's Absolutely. for sure. We'll definitely be keeping our eyes on that as uh, anything develops. Yeah. So, hey, John, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today for the news. And thanks. It's, hey, it's a pleasure to have you live on the news here. So. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be on. I enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, you're a busy guy. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so hey, you got to sign up at the, ch- the chat room. It is uh, podcastufo.com if you're listening live. And you just jump right over to the right hand sidebar, and it's a one two click, and you're in. So uh, we have our guest coming right up after this real quick music break. Um, and Kurt Collins will be joining us. How you doing, Kurt? Good. Good. Welcome to the show. And uh, I talked to you. I really wanted to have you on. After last time, I thought you did a, a really thoughtful and great balanced job when you were when you were um, interviewing Colby. So it's good to have you back. Uh, yeah, it was an un- unusual situation because we were both talking to Colby at that time, but not really to each other. That's right. That's right. But since that time, we've gotten to know each other a little bit on the phone and and through emails and stuff. And uh, and why don't you tell the uh, listening audience out there, you know, what – it's always an interesting path how someone gets involved in this subject. And what led you down the path of UFOs? Well, I was interested from childhood, and I think just probably had a civilian's interest in, in UFOs and, you know, also some of the other neat stuff like Bigfoot and everything else and, and drifted away from it. Um, but in the past few years, I became more interested and – I started looking into some military cases. I thought those might provide, uh, oh, some clues that might lead somewhere, either some documents or, um, you know, who knows if there's any film anywhere. And I came across uh, the Cash Landrum case, and that that had so many elements I'd already become familiar with. So that was that was a perfect match, and that that's something I've really been able to sink my teeth into. Yeah. Now you live in uh, somewhere in the south, right? That's right, in uh, Mississippi, in the uh, Jackson area. Uh huh. Now, what is the activity in your general general area like? And do you get involved in any of the research locally? There's there there are a fair number of sightings. There was one in uh, an area that I city that I just moved to last year that I. You know, I'm, I don't consider myself a field investigator, but I had to. There was a report of a, a black triangle in the area, so and and supposedly it was even uh, appearing at a predictable time. So uh, I chose a cold winter night to go out and look at it, and you know I stayed out there for an hour and a half. And uh, if I try it again, it's going to be in spring weather with a breeze and you know an ice cooler. Wow. So uh, field work wasn't for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hate to say it this way, but you really don't know what cold is. We, That's, yeah. <laughs> we, here in Maine, let me tell you something. We've had a winter that just won't give out, you know. It's been something else. So, um, but um, now, besides the Cash Landrum case, uh, are there other cases you've been working on or interested in or similar ones? Well, there are. Now, I've, I've really almost put blinders on to this but it is um since it ran through the 80s there's so many other things that have been involved uh it, it touches the paul benowitz case um there were some other uh sightings not nearly as well known in in the, in the 80s right before and after that and some even in the in the texas area um there was a there was a sighting in uh i became interested in in one called uh, Carol Wayne Watts uh, in Loco, Texas. That was in 1967, and that's that's regarded as a hoax, and it has men in black in it and everything else. But I found that one particularly fascinating. Uh, John Keel and, and Gray Barker both kind of covered that. And in fact, um, uh, Kevin Randall, I think that was his first field investigation. Uh, he uh, interviewed Carol Wayne Watts, and it's a, it's a pretty fantastic story because he saw this, this cylinder-shaped UFO 
And uh, in his first encounter, he only heard a voice. Uh, I think it was maybe only a week or two later where he, uh, they, uh, they kind of, uh, they didn't abduct him, but they, I guess he felt intimidated to go on board, and he got examined. And these were, these were um, little gray men, not not quite the grays as we've come to know them. But and, and the stories become regarded as a hoax. But what's interesting is that his um, aliens, as described, are, are sort of an intermediate step between what uh, uh, the hills saw and the grays as we've come to know them. And the fact that was a fabricated step is 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 strange, and you just have to wonder if 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 our ideas about aliens are not more in our heads or our understanding or our perception than however they really exist. Yeah, sounds like the missing link to me. Hey, if you're listening live on the Dark Matter Radio Network, please jump over to podcastufo.com, over to the right hand side, and jump in our chat room. And it's a one two click, and you're in. Um, so, Kurt, since you and I and Chris Lambright interviewed, well, mostly you and Chris Lambright interviewed Colby Landrum, um, there has been a couple of developments. Can we talk about any of that? Well, the the first one, um, there were a few people that got in touch, mostly that had uh, useless information, I think, that wanted to attach themselves to the case. And I wonder if that hasn't happened all along with the, I think that's, you know, anything receives publicity, but... To, to concentrate on the, the genuine developments, uh, I was able to continue conversation with Colby Landrum, and um, it's, um, it's been irregular. I think you know he's difficult to reach, mm-hmm. but um, he was able to give me some, uh, some better descriptions of the UFO, and, uh, and you know, Chris Lambright that was on, he, had, he um, had done a painting of the witnesses based painting of the scene based primarily of the lady's description and not so much with Colby's input. And after giving him, I had him go through the drawings, that had, the original case drawings, and have him pick out what he thought was the closest. And he identified a large featureless diamond. Uh, didn't have the blue lights that, that have been, you know, we've been associated with it erroneously. Right. And um, so then after, after he um, identified this big featureless diamond, I said, well, how about this? painting by Chris Lambright and he said he said that it gave him chills he oh. felt it was very close oh. and he, yeah the, the only thing he, he he said if he if he could add the helicopters into the scene which you know there uh, supposedly came in later but he felt it was very close so um, and you know just when we were talking to him and in, and in sense it's clear that his memory of events and even things afterward is not is not precise he for example he told me about um, when uh, I think their first media exposure afterwards, they went to Good Morning America. They flew to New York, and um, I asked him about the show and what it was like, and he really didn't remember it, but he remembered the limousine ride, uh-huh. and he remembered tugging on his ear to say hello to his mom during the show. <laughs> so, you know, there's little bits and pieces here and there, and I think that that's true of the, uh, the experience itself. Well, when you're seven, wasn't he seven years old or something like yeah, that? Yeah, actually, um, uh, a month short of his seventh birthday, yeah. yeah. So and you and usually when you see pictures of him, it's from a year or two later. I mean, you see, it's 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 very uh, difficult to realize. You know, just you know, he was just a step away from being a baby at the time it happened. I mean, you know, and his grandmother was very protective of him. Now there was a. Uh, I remember you writing me and uh, Peggy on the message board just mentioned this. You wrote me um, at one point that he was absolutely livid about what is it, Close Encounters, the depiction of the case. Well, that that's true, and um, the uh, now he didn't see one that was was worse. Let me tell you about this first. I think Peggy had, had seen this program. It was called uh, Unsealed Alien Files, and it was horrible. They had a a, a uh, you know they saw a. a a diamond-shaped object. Well, they depicted the UFO as a flying saucer, and it zaps Betty Cash with a ray beam. I mean, it was just so inaccurate as to be laughable if it wasn't a tragic situation. So, you know, so that was that was really terrible. But on this new show, uh, Close Encounters, which um, debuted in Canada, is now just being shown in the United States. There, um, in their depiction of it, 
Um, there were a number of errors. They get the county wrong. They say that they saw that UFO for an hour before they in, encountered it. Before they encountered it, you know, when it stopped the car. I mean, mm -hmm. and worst of all, they depicted the UFO as shooting lightning bolts somehow. Yeah. Uh, and you know that was never in any description. I, I think one researcher who was trying to analyze the the uh, propulsion of the UFO speculated that it was some sort of plasma. But the lightning that that I can tell you how that happened. Uh, there there were two researchers that they interviewed for the show, um, and they both made a couple of minor mistakes. Well, I guess the lightning I would consider a major mistake, and they didn't fact check. And you know these programs. This one is this one's called Close Encounters, and really that's the only part of the show that they uh, depict is the encounter itself. They don't follow follow up on the investigation or the lives of the people afterward. It's and, you know it's only a, a, a half hour show, and they do uh, 15 minutes per case, well less with commercials. So um, you know they just get in there, they do a dramatic recreation, and uh, yeah, but there were several points of inaccuracy. Now I think the show, I mean, has good good production values. They've chose some reasonable cases and stay away from the sensational uh, alien abductions and things like that. But it could be better still. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, like you said, Colby is hard to, you know, keep in touch with. And I do remember when we were interviewing him, someone actually, I believe, it could have been on the message board or it could have been a call and I can't remember, but uh, prompted him to do a FOIA request Freedom of Information Act um, request on papers regarding this. Has anything like that happened at all? I, I mentioned that to Colby, but um, he had. Um, I think I'm not sure if he had if he had moved for a for a new job outside his his home when we recorded our show. But I know he he had when I talked to him last, and and really haven't had contact since. So mm -hmm. I think he's been been kind of busy with that. But uh, I certainly have intended to. There, um, I, I thought that the chance of getting him to do a um, a privacy waiver might yield better results because sometimes they they the government's reluctant to release in, information on individuals. You know, they, they think it's going to be a violation of their privacy. So him signing that would would uh, relieve them of that worry. Uh huh. Uh huh. You know, I thought it was interesting when he was on the show. You know, I don't want to just rehash the whole show in this show. But um, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting is what he thought the craft was, you know, most likely government or military. And, you know, that almost makes the most sense when you really look at all the options. You know? it's, um, it's a very tempting scenario. And what we're missing is evident, but an evidence of anything else also. Uh, the one one po good point that was made on the Close Encounter show is that there's been no classified vehicle that resembles that. Um, it's um, it, that it's really puzzling though because the you know, if it was a classified device, it would have to have a history of development, probably of several years. Um, usually, there there are prototypes. A stages, you know, several prototypes before something's built. So it's, it, it could be, but the secrecy required is extraordinary. Well, you know, like Peggy just mentioned on the, on the message board, she doesn't think that it was military, but she thinks the military was involved. And, you know, that's quite a scenario right there. And, you know, perhaps that makes kind of sense in a way. Oh, well, that's, um, that touches on something I'd, I just recently gave a, um, um, a Skype talk to the, the MUFON Alabama group, and I got in touch with uh, a member of the, the unit that's uh, Task Force 160, the, um, the Night Stalkers, the helicopter group that grew out of the chief suspect for the helicopters in the Cash Lantern case. And there's a, there's a pilot there. That he joined in 1984, but he's given me a lot of useful information on the, the operation of the helicopter unit the helicopters themselves, and now he he's also a UFO um, uh, investigator, field investigator for MUFON. So you know, I think he's sympathetic, and I don't believe he's being deceptive in any way. And one of the things that he's he said is um, he just doesn't believe with the the distance involved that it could have been anything 
but well, it couldn't be a response. There's there's no way that the, the helicopters had the fuel to get from a base to the scene. He thinks that for whatever reason, they had to be flying along with it. Now, so uh-huh. Peggy's on to something. <laughs> yeah, and I believe uh, you, you threw me an email about this uh, this pilot, and uh, we have a guest. Uh, Skinny Bob is asking. Are you familiar with the Black Deltas, which were supposed to be the huge black op military craft that are lighter than an aircraft, like Zeppelins? I've heard of that, um, but have no no specific knowledge. Um, it, the name, though, is interesting because the, uh, Paul Benowitz had a drawing of a what he called a Black Delta ship, and he thought it was atomic powered, and he made connections between that and the Cash Lantern case. But you know, that's all speculation. Right, but it's you know it's interesting, but yeah, it, it um the the lighter than air aspect is interesting because the the UFO in this case did seem to be almost balloon like or anti gravity, and you know we don't know what the the fire burst was, but that didn't seem to be what was propelling it. It might have been for uh, something to stabilize it or a leak of some kind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, now. About ufology in general, you're not really, <clears throat> pardon me, that much involved in it. And um, but but you are mostly in this case. Is that what I'm hearing from you? I've got an I've got a broader interest, but a specific focus. If that makes sense to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about the broader interest. Are there other aspects of the field that that uh, you like to, you know, for instance? Do you ever look into, well, let's say the abductions, or do you ever look into different types of crafts or, or uh, things like that, or any other historic cases um, come to mind to you? Well, yes. Um, I, due to my initial interest, which was back during the, oh, say, the NICAP days, I do kind of favor the cases from generally from the 60s back to the Kenneth Arnold sighting. And I've, I've probably read more about those than I have uh, more modern accounts. And so because of that, I'm, I'm less familiar with the abduction scenarios except for, um, oh, the Parker Hickson, which happened in Mississippi. So I always had a particular interest in that. And, of course, the Hill abductions. But um, that's uh, that is probably the my least um, familiar territory yeah. and the, the the some of the early cases like level land texas some of these involved objects which were remotely similar to the cash lantern case a, a, a large egg-shaped um you know it, it was either brilliant or or flaming and uh, in those cases and there was also one uh in lock raven and i forget what state that's in um that they affected um automobile engines and, uh, and and the people felt heat and thought they had a sunburn like symptoms so you know you have to wonder you know with the visual sim- similarity and the similarity of symptoms if those couldn't be related and I mean and you know there's of course you know, like the frustrating thing in all UFOs uh, uh, cases is, is the coming up with the, with adequate proof. I mean, there's a definite experience. You've got credible witnesses, but you know when you find proof or, or evidence left behind, you can't always piece it together. So, right. yeah. Well, you know, you think of like you just mentioned egg shape, like the Socorro um, incident. Is that one of the ones you're? So there was a big flame that came out of that thing, and heat yeah, and everything. Yeah, but not the but not the object itself, and and that's an interesting too, one too because, um, well, for example, the, the ones in Texas I just mentioned, those did not have a. They were a, basically a fire-like shape, but Socorro was a definite structure. You know, it had legs and apparently a hatch and. And there was a symbol on it. There's no mistaking that for a natural object. I mean, there's no confusion between those two. That that's one case that's fascinating because it's a, you know, it, it's clearly an intelligently designed and, and manned craft. Uh, and uh, you know, that's a, that's a, our, our friend Chris Lambright. That's a favorite of his, and he in, uh, interviewed Officer Zamora, and that uh, that was. Um, I think a turning point in Dr. Hynek's opinion about about UFOs 
that they couldn't all be mistakes of uh, of astronomical features, and you know the the traces left behind. Uh, you know some of some of them were ambiguous, but you know you had a highly credible witness there. Right, right, and uh, you know you you talk about evidence, and I I, I speak with uh, Ray uh, Stanford. Um, who eventually I'm going to meet and spend some time at his house down in Baltimore. And he was like right there about, he was there the same time Heineck was there. And, you know, I think I might have mentioned this in a pa- past podcast, but if you read his book, I forget what it's called, The Flying Saucer, Socorro, whatever it is, um, he actually picked up a rock that had metal scrapings on it. You know, he actually had the closest thing to evidence because it was right where the pad landed. Um, of one of the three legs that came down on that thing. <laughs> he had that actually in his hands at one time and, and lost it through uh, when he was getting it tested. So they scraped it all off and it was gone. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'll tell you, you know, that's that's a show I would love to hear. He's He has spanned uh, the, the ages. I mean, I, I think a lot of times people forget about his contribution to the field just because of, uh, uh, he's um, not a so involved in, in, in current research and it's kind of uh, isolated himself and, and chooses only to, to discuss things with a number of people. But um, he must have some great stories. Yes, he's a, he's a brilliant man. He actually uh, researches dinosaurs for a living. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen his name in the news about that. He's yeah, discovered he's, a number of fossils and tracks. He found tracks right on the Beltway in Baltimore, <laughs> which is amazing. Hey, um, someone was asking on on y- the uh, chat room. What is your opinion on disclosure? Hmm. Uh, have you thought about I'm, it? <laughs> I have. I, okay. I have, and I'm 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 kind of I'm conflicted. I'm uh, get to be honest. Um, I've um, I've read uh, uh, Doctor Alexander's book, uh, John Alexander. And I tend to agree with some of the things he said was that the government may not actually know very much, and maybe their interest is focused on security. Um, you know, the the um, uh, Donald Kehoe, who introduced a lot of the world to, to UFOs, it was his his belief that the government did know what was going on; they were hiding it from us. But I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that the I'm not convinced that uh, they they are part of a secret alliance with aliens or, you know, those, those things are interesting. But I, I just – and also I don't think they're very good at keeping secrets. It's possible, and I'd like to know um, – I'd like to know more about there, – there's certainly things that they haven't told us because it relates to military secrets or they think it does. You know, they're very choosy about what they, what what's shared with us. Uh, very protective of their operational policies and things. Whether and, and there's a lot of controversy over what they're learning about us. But yeah, I, I would like to know more. But I, I just don't think that they have the answers. And I really think it's up to us, uh, researchers, and uh, to uh, to do the work. I mean, it's, just look typically how the government conducts research. They they uh, they outsource it. They they con- you know even Dr. Heineck was contracted as an astronomer for the Air Force, so you know they may buy the answer from, from someone, but I don't think they have it themselves. A lot of times I think that you know some part of the government might know that UFOs exist, but maybe they're on the same page as us that they don't know what they are. You know, uh, right. I, I, you know because they're certainly still taking reports you know very quietly and involved in that um you know even though they say they're not even in norad you know i mean you hear all these things where these papers i think john greenwald has uh, uncovered some you know documents um that they're still yes it was him and that they're still um taking reports very quietly or or documenting them well they have to there's there's always going to be an element of uh, of just um of a threat from whether whether it's a missile or an en- enemy plane, and but you know I certainly want to know if, if an alien or a time traveler or whatever it could be is peeping in on us or you know could could be a threat, but um, it's um, yeah I 
it's it's unfortunate that that Blue Book went the way that it did. I mean, it was. Some people say it was nothing more than uh, than public relations. I I don't know that that's true, and but I, I wish that there was some some agency that to uh, you know even if it was just to channel it into the private sector and help coordinate with with the uh, with the uh, groups. Sure, I it, agree it, with that. And uh, you know, you you take a look at all the countries that take it seriously, and unfortunately, it's hard to do this show at eight o'clock and. Eastern Time, New York Time, when um, we have people like, for instance, I would like to get uh, Klaas Svahn back on in Sweden because, you know, that's another country that takes things seriously. There's no ridicule or very little ridicule about it. And Brazil and, uh, you know, France, you know, all these countries have a little section that is paying attention to this and, you know, want to know more about it. And Jose Lay, I really uh, enjoyed speaking with him a number of times at a conference and actually, uh, you know, interviewing him. Uh, and how serious Brazil takes this whole thing. And it doesn't have to be, you know, tomfoolery. It can be studied uh, scientifically and looked at um, because it's something's going on. And you would think that when these countries do take it seriously that it would eventually rub off and – and uh Someone would start talking about it here in this country in the government. Oh, uh, that that reminded me of a couple of things. One is I saw that Leslie Kane is uh, is touring in France promoting her book, and apparently he's been very well received there. So they're they're mm-hmm. um, they're taking things seriously. And um, the the other thing that reminded me of is um, the um, one of the tools that I've used quite heavily in in the research that I've done is has been the internet and. I've heard uh, Kevin Randall mention that uh, that was something that that um, you know, he wishes he could, I guess, kind of move it back in time so that he had had some of those resources available. And so often you can you can pull a document, and it and you know I, from my own research I can tell you, you absolutely cannot find everything you want, but it the you can the things that you can find quickly, and then identify what else what are the documents you need. You know that is such a huge savings of time, and um, and besides that, you're able to uh, to contact other researchers to share information, and, and when you were talking about international interests, I've I've got um, email pen pals around the world, and some are skeptics, some are believers, and uh, it's just just to be able to instantly communicate with them, well sometimes with the help of a translator, but still. Yeah, you know, that's that is just a amazing resource. And there's a uh I have got a Russian friend and several times he has an immense UFO library and I've had him uh scan documents. You know, it it's it's strange to think that, you know, to find out an an old APRO or MUFON report that I have to go to Russia to get it, but sometimes that's the <laughs> fastest way. Ah, well, how about that? Yes, I have I have some connections in, in Russia and you know, they, they, they're they sort of, uh, for the most part, you know, Russia's extremely large, a huge country. and But they, they take um, it more or less serious um, for the most part. And I don't know if you heard about this, about the Ukraine. That Did you happen to see the video of the big cylinder-shaped UFO that went over the Ukraine right, right near, uh, Krim, um, I can't remember how you said it, Crimea? Um, no. You know what I mean. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't seen that. Uh, how, yeah. how recent is that? Oh, that was uh, a few weeks ago. That happened, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I'll tell. I'd have to tell you. I'm. I'm slightly allergic to YouTube videos. I have to wait until I get a personal recommendation. <laughs> yeah, I understand so that. There's so many. Yeah. Oh. There's a. Uh, it's. YouTube is unfortunately it's a it's a double edged sword. Um, there's there's. What happens is all the trash that's it uh, muddies the water of the legitimate ones, you know. It's it's too bad because there there are a lot of good videos on there, but there's also a lot of people either trying to make a name for themselves or having fun with CGI or, you know, uh, it's it's a shame. And then, um, you know, I'm just gonna plain say this: third phase of the moon. <laughs> you want to stay away from all the listeners. I'm just telling you that's. There's a lot of bogus videos that they put on that, and, you know, uh, he can sue me if he wants, 
but um, I think he's just a big BSer, and it's a big problem. Well, I've uh, checked that out. I agree with you. If he's suing you, I guess I'll see sit next to you at the table in court. Um, <laughs> I totally agree with that. The um, the um, the one thing I will say about them is that a couple of times they've had people like Stanton Friedman appear uh, on their show or, or do a video of them, and um, that is my only exception. I will sometimes check. I don't know how a legitimate person ever winds up getting connected with him, but it has happened a few times. And I listened to the, uh, oh, what, if if you do watch a video, even with the reputable person, um, just don't look at the screen because there's going to be some baloney pictures up. Just listen to the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what are the, you know, along these lines, um, why do you think people do hoax? You know, what is it that, what is it kind of like the same type of people that write viruses for computers do you think oh well that's yeah that's that's kind of a malicious thing but well you know I, i've actually thought about hoaxers quite a bit um in fact i had a friend who had committed a few hoaxes when he was young and and um uh, irresponsible uh that was that was jim mosley um hmm. i've i've examined yeah, I, I'm not doing, done a formal study of this, but I think there's a few types. And the ones that you compared to viruses, I think some of them are kind of like uh, pyromaniacs. They they enjoy um, starting trouble and seeing what happens, you know. And, and But I think they're also egotistical, and they want to claim credit for it. Um, the um, uh, in, in hoaxing, you know, some other people are, um, you know, do want to – draw attention to themselves i mean and the, but the, but hoaxing is in by no means unique to the ufo field in fact i think um mm -hmm. the, the paranormal field uh the the hoaxing there began way back i mean you know probably before the 1900s i, I could um and well, sure you know i probably it probably from the beginning of time you know really there's there's uh you know the People selling medicines on, you know, I mean, on the, on the stumps and uh, the soap boxes, and you know, there's always uh, yeah. some type of hoaxing going on. Well, I'm, I'm glad you nature. mentioned. I'm glad you mentioned that because that uh, the fraud and monetary game, it, that that's one thing. But you know, some other people are, um, you know, they're they're trying to make a book off it, and you could. You could go through uh, the history of ufology and, and pick out some of those. One of them is the, the famous uh, Aztec uh, crash, Silas Newton and Dr. G. And uh, they, they were promoting this, uh, the UFO crash, as a way to sell these fake instruments to detect oil. They claim to have used the, the magnetic devices from the recovered UFO technology to make oil detectors, basically. Mm. And... Um, so, you know, there, there are fakes like that that, that, that are cashing in. Uh, there, was, there was one guy, I think it was Buck Nelson, and he claimed to have gone to outer space. And he had a, I can't remember if his dog, he claimed his dog was from outer space had gone with him. Anyway, he sold clippings of his dog's hair as souvenirs. And, wow. you know, just some off-the-wall things like that. Um, you know, and, along uh, these lines, I'd like to say something, um, since I already trashed third phase of the moon. <laughs> um, you know, it seems to me that some, sometimes I can get a little bit discouraged in this field, and it seems to me that the crazier and more outrageous someone becomes in this field, the more followers they have. What, what do you, what, what's your take on that? Well, you have a good point. For one thing, well, one of my favorite UFO sightings, just to provide contrast, was uh, Charles B. Moore, 1949, April. He's he's uh, he's launching weather balloons with a, with a team of men. They uh, they see uh, a um, a sphere. No, it wasn't really spherical. It was it was kind of like a flat oval thing flying across. And they're looking at I forget what the name of the device is, but basically it's a telescope to observe things like uh, weather balloons and such. So, I mean, you have a scientific instrument that he's watching this through, and it, it, go, it goes across the sky at a huge rate of speed and then goes upwards. Well, the thing is, this 
I can't remember, but you know, we're talking about maybe a minute or so. Well, it's, it's an incredible sighting. It's something unearthly, but you know, it's, it's over and done. And, and it's not interesting as a story. And then you get something like a George Adamski, and he meets this space man and te- communicates with him telepathically. And, and it's this long, involved story, and usually the guy's right there at the center of it. And, and a lot of times he continues to have a series of adventures. Um, and it's, it's a good story. That's the difference. Right, right. Um, you know, but you, you, there are people in, in this field, um, you know, there's there's someone right now going through some court trouble. Uh, he's in big trouble, and, you know, he's he's got a lot of support, and he's blaming things, of course, on the government, and his wife is right, you know, at his back with it. Um, and then, you know, they just have a huge amount of followers, and the people out there that are doing the serious work, there are people like like Stan, you talked about earlier, um, you know, someone like him, I think, deserves a lot of people uh, listening to him and, you know, uh, paying attention to him. But these people that come up, like you just mentioned, Ademsky, you know, I mean, people like that, they had all the, it's kind of like a cult, you know, it it's is. the only other way I can think of it. And, you know, we pick on Dr. Stephen Greer, you know, and a lot of people give me hate mail after I do that. But, uh, you know, he's a very intelligent man. He's well-spoken. But um, he can go down those paths that, uh, you know, are just outrageous, you know, um, ambassador of the universe and, and bringing in, you know, summoning in craft and all that. It's, it's pretty outrageous. Well, I don't want to drag myself into this example I'm about to bring up, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the things that uh, – a lot of times the charlatans are uh, the ones that are demonstrating the personality and charisma and everything. So, you know, and, and Dr. Hynek had a had a beard and, and a pipe, but, you know, he wasn't really a fireball in the personality department. So so maybe just as your, your, your little yardstick, look at, um, you know, the, the dull guys are probably doing the real research. Ah, that's right. You know, that, it's sad to say, but you're probably right. You're probably right. And it's the same thing with, you know, true scientists. A lot of true scientists aren't some of you, you know, I mean, that are really intense and they're so involved in what they're doing, they don't, you know, really focus too much on the social parts. We have about four minutes uh, left to this show, and I'm just looking to see if we have any. um, Someone was asking a little bit earlier on, uh, Lee was asking, um, was there a point where you were skeptical about the UFO field to begin with, and what, if so, what made you uh, turn into you know taking it more seriously? Hmm. Well, I'm still skeptical. I want I want proof, and I, there there are a lot of things that that I I guess I just kind of have to uh, to to keep an open mind about. But um, you know, I I believe in in the possibilities and. Um, I, I don't take everyone's word f- for anything. I, 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 I try to have to, I just hate to say that I rely on, rely on the way things sound and feel, but a lot of times it is a gut reaction. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, but, but I like the things that can actually be investigated. I, I don't like just, I prefer not to deal with stories where, where someone's gone and they, they've seen something. I mean, it's almost, it's, some of you have, the, <laughs> I get excited about this. The ones that are the most frustrating, they could almost be spiritual visions because there's nothing to ex- investigate. Exactly. Exactly. Um, let's see. Peggy wanted to know, are there any current cases that, you know, we only have a couple minutes left, but are there any current cases that are ongoing right now that uh, interest you? Mm, you, can, I've... you can say no. No, well, let's, okay. Let's let's. <laughs> I, I'm interested, but not following closely. I, and the uh, the, uh, the the black tri- triangles continue to fascinate me, but I haven't found anything that I could sink my teeth into there. Right, right. Yes, that that is one that fascinates me too. And there's uh, I forget the gentleman's name that has written a book on the black triangles. That one is interesting. In, um, you know, getting me fascinated because you hear of. So many similar cases, and I would love to find out more 
about that. Uh, um, so, Kurt, where can someone find you on the internet? I've got uh, I've got a site called BlueBlurryLines dot com, and I've got now that's going to be ninety percent information on the Cash Landrum case. But the the thing that I feel that's important about this is that there. Um, I'm looking into not just the case itself, but the way that it was investigated, and I think that there's also the issue of mil- military secrecy. So, so whatever's going on here, I think this is why I focused on it: is that it, it applies to a lot of other UFO cases. So, uh, I think that you know, getting getting to the bottom of this, or at least understanding it a little better, you know, it can be applied to, to many other things. Uh huh. You know, uh, Peggy just said there were a couple of uh, about 20 reports. Uh, boomerang and triangle sites uh, just today on MUFON. So, yeah, they they seem to be the going uh, vehicle of the the choice craft of whatever's visiting us. Yeah, it, it's so interesting. I just wonder if uh, uh, the um, if if it if it's a trend, you know, if it's almost like if you hear a new word and learn it, all of a sudden you hear it everywhere. Is it? Is are we being kind of conditioned to to notice that? Is it in, when we were looking? Were we just looking for the wrong thing when we were only looking for saucers or or cylinders? But there, there are there people have gone back and looked and have found some older triangle sightings. But yeah. you know, it definitely you know is is much more prevalent today than it than it was long ago. All right. Well, Peggy was yelling at me that it was not. The last 20 was the last 20 reports. Well, that's it for tonight. Um, thank you, Kurt. And uh, that's it for our show. So if you missed any part of the show, you can catch it as a podcast and a whole bunch of other free podcasts on our website, which is podcastufo.com. Also, you can check out our links and stories and our show notes, as well as joining in the conversation in our forums. I want to thank everyone for helping out with the show today. Keith Rowland, the producer of the Dark Matter Radio Network, Andy Fleming for the Astronomy News, John Tobin for the UFO News, Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse for our music, and Peggy Shining for managing our Facebook page. And remember to like us on Facebook. I think we have about 8,000 people on there now. And Peggy keeps up with all the UFO news, so check that out at uh, facebook.com slash podcastufo. You can just check us out live next week right here on the Dark Matter Radio Network and every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And don't forget to jump in the chat room at podcastufo.com. This is Martin Willis reminding you to keep your eyes to the sky 